morning. You beat me to it. Couldn't get the mic switch on, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, um, that's right. That's the way we need to start off worship, with a little bit of laughter. You know, Denise isn't here. Pastor Mike isn't here. We can all relax and just have a good time, right? All right. Well, hey, welcome. Um, I see we have a few guests or visitors with us today as well, too. I'm Micah. I'm the worship leader here at First Church, and that's great for you folks at home as well. Um, We have a great worship service planned today, and so we're grateful that you're here. And uh, one of the things we believe and practice is that worship is so much more than an hour on Sunday morning. And so Uh, If you're new with us, if you'd like to connect, if you'd like to continue the conversation, uh, we have a handy number up there, 308-730-4040. Text WELCOME to that number, and that'll help us out. You can also use the uh, uh, connect cards that are in your pews as well. So uh, either way, works out great. Um, For those of us that are here, we know that that number is great for sharing prayer requests. um, And same thing with the connect cards, if you want to share a prayer request. Um, One thing I know is a lot of people try something new or try to get on a better habit or routine or ritual um, in the new year. And so I love that energy around that, doing something new. It's fun. It's exciting. And I want to be able to be an encouragement to you in that. So if you have a New Year's resolution or something like that that you want to share, um, I invite you to do so through our prayer chain or our prayer uh, works here so that we can join you in prayer and support you in that way as well. Um, It's fun being able to encourage one another. One of the things we've been talking about a lot in the month of December is small groups. And that was because we launched some new small groups, and it was a lot of fun. It was great getting folks together. Um, Lots and lots of good came out of that. And we're going to continue the momentum. Actually, starting next Monday, we have our first of new groups that are launching, The Man Code, led by Pastor Mike. Um, I really am inviting you to focus on that one or sign up for that one because um, it's starting and it's only six weeks long. So you can actually be done by Valentine's Day, all right? So men, just quick note, if your wife's been bugging you or elbowing you, this is the one, okay? Uh, Just take it as a sign, all right? Um, But lots of other groups coming up and one of the things that many of our groups study is actually the message every week. They do what's called sermon-based and that will partner with our new message series starting next week. It's called Starting Over and we're going to be talking about the book of Ruth, um, looking at her whole story and how God does really beautiful things and even some of the smallest and simple things. Actually kind of a continuation of our message today. So we're excited for that. Um, I didn't have screens for a couple of these because I just got the emails. Um, One, if you have a poinsettia, I invite you to take it home. Please leave the altar ones. Those are here for worship. But if you ordered one, uh, go on ahead and grab it. There are bags on the on the table to help protect them. Um, and then we are feeding the hungry this week. We're going to serve at the Salvation Army on January, Friday the 5th. Um, and I've been informed that we really need servers. This is a really important outreach of our church, and it's uh, something I'm going to talk about a little bit more later, but uh, just show up. It's as easy as showing up and serving and helping out. So mark your calendars that Friday, and that's what we have. We are here to hear a word from God, and I'm going to invite you to begin our worship now with me and stand and join our voices together in our call to celebration. It's a responsive reading. Follow along on the screens. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall always be on my lips. My soul boasts in our God. Let the humble hear and be glad. Magnify the Lord our God. Let us exalt his name together. Amen. We're going to sing our first song, Good Christian Friends Rejoice, number 224 in your hymnal. The words are also on the screen.
seated. Well, we continue in worship with uh, time to recognize where God has been at work in our lives and in our ministry here at First Church. And um, something that I wanted to highlight is, is actually this mission that we talk about of feeding the hungry. Um, I was having a conversation with a new friend yesterday morning and talking about how you can't be everything to everyone because then you'll be just, you won't be able to do or accomplish what you really want to. And that is actually lived out here in the mission and ministry of First Church. Our number one outreach is feeding the hungry. I mean, when you think about the hundred meals at minimum we, we serve every week at Wednesday night supper or, or at the connection. And then uh, whenever they hear we're serving at the Salvation Army, the number about doubles. So um, it's pretty incredible that that mission is something we're able to do and we do it well and we really focus on that. And other ways we support that ministry and one of the things I love is generosity uh, begets generosity. You know, sometimes we think once we give, the giving's done, but we all know this and there's kind of the cliche after Christmas. Well, we need to keep the Christmas spirit of giving going, but how do we do that? Well, um, we continue to give. And one of the ways that we do that at the church is we also support the Salvation Army through, uh, through their food drives and those kind of things. We also ring bells. And you would think, um, I, I just love the generosity of those who went out to ring bells because it promoted more generosity, right? They just kept giving. And so it was really cool. Um, just the way we serve. You know, it's really hard to minister somebody when they're hungry. And so this year, uh, ringing bells for the Salvation Army, supporting that same mission, we uh, raised over $1,400, which is pretty incredible. So uh, that's a kudos to you all as a church and a thank you for uh, serving because you helped others be generous. And that's one of the aspects of our ministry here. So I've talked enough about that. We have Mr. Emerald here to sing this morning. I'm going to invite him up to sing. Um, but if you'd like to uh, give today, I invite you to do so in the offering plate, do so online or mail or uh, stop by the office. And I just so appreciate your generosity. We now get a gift of Mr. Emerald's song. stools and back row pews I ran to one more than the other but I couldn't outrun you trying to fill up all the empty trying to numb the pain inside thinking you'd never forgive me for all those Saturday nights but thank God for Sunday morning thank God for 316 and the word Let's 
light through the stained glass windows feels like freedom on my face really is a new beginning it really is amazing grace thank god for sunday morning thank god for Well, we are an Easter people, kind of odd to say with all the Christmas decorations up, right? But we truly are, and so, Emerald, thank you so much for that and inspiring our worship. We're going to continue now in a time of prayer, and I invite you to join me uh, as well. Well, Father in heaven, we thank you today. As Emerald just sang, we thank you for Sunday morning, a chance to gather, a chance to sit back, to look through the stained glass windows and appreciate the awe and the wonder and the majesty that you are. Father in heaven, we're mindful today of, of all that is going on in the world, of all that's going on in our own lives. On the last day of the year, it's easy to sit back and, and just breathe and Try not to worry about what Monday has in store. And so, Jesus, my prayer today is that you would begin with those worries. Speak to each and every one of them, the stressors, the worries, the anxieties that we all face. For some of us, that stress looks like grief. For some of us, and for those especially outside of the church, it looks like an unknowing, an uncertainty. And that's hard. So Jesus, we ask that you would be with them and we ask that you would be with us to know your love, to know your goodness, and to know your forgiveness. Help us to be agents of each and every one of those things. And just help us to continue to worship and glorify your name. We ask all of this in your holy and precious name, Jesus, who also taught us to say together your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we're going to continue in our worship now with another song, We Three Kings. It's the subject of our message today, so we're going to sing all five verses. Y'all ready? Let's stand as we are able. Lynn and Mary Lynn will lead us.
be seated. We've got a minute or two to burn. Has anyone got a favorite hymn they'd like to sing? Well, surely somebody does. How about How Great Thou Art? Anybody know that one? Marilyn, help us out, would you? 77, maybe. <laughs> You know I'm old and I know the number of the hymns, huh? First verse, everybody knows it. Looks like we still have a minute or two to burn. Who else has a favorite? Silent Night. Christmas is over. <laughs> 239. <laughs> 239, if you don't know the words. do a benediction? <laughs> Mike is shaking his head. No benediction. 93? Very good. Thank you. What's the song, Doug? What is it? Oh, that's a cool one. 
My dad came home from uh, General Conference in about 1968 with that song, and I had to learn it immediately. Yep, we sang it a lot, didn't we? I can tell you a story about that. Doug would get a kick out of this. Um, back at Elsie, every summer, it was uh, our tradition to do what we're doing right now. All summer long, we would sing three hymns, just whatever someone chose. And, uh, of course, I was sitting where Mary Lynn is, and my dear friends would pick out their favorites, which always had about five sharps. No one had ever heard. That's how I grew up, right? 93, let all the world in every corner sing. the arrangement that Doug was looking for, I guarantee you. Let all the world in every corner sing, my God and King. What's the number of that one? Hey, we're back here. Can we all thank Lynn and Mary Lynn? I apologize. Thank you for being adaptive and flexible. Our Brady Church uh, that we're supporting um, is having an error, and they, you know, so anyway, playing tech guy on top of everything. This is why we need each other, right? This is why we need Pastor Mike and, and different things as well. So today I'm grateful. Uh, Grateful for stepping up, being able to go with the flow. Thank you to all of you. Uh, we're going to continue in our worship now uh, as we conclude our message series. We've had our children reading scripture all month long, and so why stop there? We have Mr. Coy sharing our scripture from the book of Matthew today. And I think the computer's muted, Adam. Just press the volume key. On your keyboard. We need to get a real tech guy here. That, not me, setting this up. Let's try it one more time. Hi, I'm Koi. Today's scripture is Matthew 2, 1 through 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is this child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star of the east and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when he would find him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they had set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen in the east, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they had saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child 
with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and haven't been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks to be to God. Happy New Year. Oh man, it's it's a fun time to work with those kids. Coy did a nice job, didn't he? He just his grandma's here today. Well, uh, you all don't always realize how much you influence us as well, and I wanted to share one of those influences with you all. Um, Miss Bev Williams came into the office actually a little before Thanksgiving and shared something with me. She had a smile on her grin. She said, read this, read this right here. And she opened up her book, and, and it was the start of chapter 2. And uh, so we were all standing around there in the office, and, and I just took the book, and I just read it to everybody. And, and then after I read that, I thought, you know, when I talk about the wise men, I need to, I need to read this to you all. So here it is from Miss Bev Williams. I think this is hilarious. Some people have suggested that history would have been considerably different if the wise men had actually been wise women. Since that's not what happened, the best we can do is conjecture what might have occurred if the wise women welcomed the baby Jesus rather than the wise men. If it had been the wise women rather than the wise men, some say the wise women would have asked for directions and arrived on time. Others say they would have helped deliver the baby and cleaned the stable. Some would have brought gifts rather than gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They would have made a casserole, brought practical gifts, including diapers, wipes, bibs, and formula. (laughs) Oh, man, it's so funny. It's it's good. You know, I love looking at Scripture through different lenses and appreciating uh, just different perspectives. And today, that's what we're doing as we conclude our message series, Unlikely Heroes. Throughout the month of December, we've kind of explored what it would look like to be in one of these supporting roles, not one of the main characters like Mother Mary, who seems almost angelic, or to be Jesus himself is is something we know we can't do. But we could maybe be an innkeeper or, or a shepherd. And to imagine what it would be like has been powerful for me. One of my main takeaways in this is, wow, God can still work in me in very unlikely ways. And he can work through me and this church in unlikely ways. I hope you've taken that away too. And this birth story is so miraculous that, and, and actually so familiar that it's unlikely you read it with any awe or wonder anymore. I mean, when you read the scripture, you know, about uh, Herod there, and, and oh wow, Herod Herod wanted to find out. That's malicious intent. He wants to, you know, we later find out he wanted to kill the baby. We don't get worked up about that. We don't, we don't read that Mary's pregnant and go, whoa, does Joseph know? Well, yeah, an angel told him, and we just accept that as fact. But wait, did you hear Joseph said an angel told him that Mother Mary was pregnant? Like, hold on. Is he nuts? What is going on? We need to, like, he's been drinking out of the wrong, wrong, wrong wine barrel. Let's, let's check on Joseph, you know? This, this is the way we often should read Scripture, but we don't because it's so familiar, and we kind of disengage. When they get there, there's no room in the inn. It's, it's just normal to us, but we forget how unlikely this is. The surprise, the wonder, the mystery of Christ can often be something we lose sight of when in reality God is the most unlikely. God uses the most unlikely, the most average, and the most ordinary of us to accomplish his mission. 
Now I know what you're thinking. All right, Micah, for these last characters, the Magi, these wise men, they're not average. They're not ordinary. I mean, who is able to afford to give a baby expensive perfumes and gold, right? Like, that's a lot. I just got back from vacation, and I'm, like, wondering about the bank account, and that was only three days, and they were out for, like, six months exploring, looking for the kid, like, oh, that's no big deal. Hey, hey, honey, you want to go find this? Uh, let's go follow the star, you know? Some traditions say these men were kings, or like lords of the land, if you will. But I don't know that their status, their wealth... Any of these things are what makes them wise, or why we should look to them as wise men and follow their example. I mean, they're clearly on an adventure here, so what can we learn from it, and how can we have the same type of adventure where we encounter the Christ? I know a lot of people today who honestly could fit in the category of magi. You know, smart, well-educated, maybe have some influence in the community. I mean, think about it. They just stopped by and saw Herod, the king of the area. That, that was a big deal. If you wanted to go anywhere or do anything, you checked in with the Roman government, and he was king. And they just walked in like it was no big deal. But I, I still, I don't think it was their status or even their ability to follow the stars and find the Christ child. I believe what made the wise men wise was their heart of worship. The honor, the homage you heard Koi say. And I wonder, is that something that we can do today? Can we pay the Christ child? Can we pay the Christ the same type of worship, the same type of wonder? I believe the way we respond to a gift, like the Christ child, reveals a lot about our character. The Magi, they were responding to the gift of Christ, and we will look at their example more, but I want to look at the Israelites for a second, because they teach us a lot of what not to do, right? So, when they first were granted their freedom, what did they do? They went into the desert and complained. Y'all thought I was going to say something good. No, they complained. They were a bunch of whiners. Exodus 16, 3. If only we had died at the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread. Which, by the way, they were dying in Egypt. They, they leave that part out. For you have brought, you Moses have brought us out into this wilderness to kill the, kill this whole, you're going to kill us all with hunger. A bunch of whiners. And a little dramatic. But God gives them their desire. He answers their prayer. And they get a gift from heaven. I mean, as if the gift of freedom wasn't enough. They get free, fresh Panera every morning. Or manna, not Panera, okay? Fresh quail every evening. A little extra on Saturdays so you don't have to cook on Sunday. I mean, this is, this is pretty easy traveling in the desert, if we're honest here. But is it enough? No, they get thirsty a little later on in their journey as you read through Exodus. And, and this desire, this cultivation, this hunger that they have, that they keep cultivating, it even drives Moses off track to where he hits the stone too many times and he doesn't get to receive the promise of God in the promised land. You would think they'd learn their lesson, but they get to the promised land. What do they want? More. We need, we need more, God. So they give, him, they give them judges. That's what that's for. Judges are a gift from God to help lead the people. But that leadership wasn't enough. So give us kings. That wasn't enough. More, more, more. We need to be very careful about what we cultivate in our hearts. They took each heavenly gift, each word from God for granted and failed to appreciate them. I think they did what we all do. And maybe at first when they saw the manna, they were worshipful. They were grateful. But on day 781, manna again for breakfast, you're not quite as grateful. 
You probably remember opening gifts as a child. It's not much different than that. When you were, when you were a young child, my mom tells a to- story about me when I was a kid. Um, my first Christmas that I could talk, I walk out. The, the spread is incredible. Santa was generous. My grandparents were generous. My parents were generous. I'm the first kid, the first grandkid on that side. I got what I deserved. Let's be real here. But apparently I walked out and I looked at it and I, I just looked up to heaven and I said, Thank you, Santa. Yeah, misplaced a little bit, but I was too. Um, but what happens? And you can think about your own journey. And I know my face said this when I was a teenager and I opened the box and go, Oh, I already have one of these. Or, man, I really wanted the blue one, not the red one. You don't even have to say it, but you know you had that feeling like, oh, this isn't quite what I wanted. How spoiled and rotten are we sometimes? It starts by being careful, careful about the cravings we cultivate in our heart. If it's always based on things or experiences that we don't have, then happiness, the unlikely adventure of life, and all of its blessings will be a fleeting moment that we'll have for a second and then quickly disappear. I like the way English poet and theologian Thomas Doreen says, or said, to prize blessings and not have them is to be in hell. To have blessings and to prize them is to be in heaven. I'm going to have Adam keep that on the screen because the place that I read this quote from was in context of a story. And this man was reflecting at the end of the year on his life and and what had been going on. And and he was about my age, you know. They had taken a surprise trip to the Grand Canyon, so he had got out his bucket list. And a lot of people keep those. Not a big deal, but he, he crossed... He crossed going to the Grand Canyon off the list. And it was pretty cool. But, you know, when you cross something off the list, you got to add to it. And so he was doing that. He spent an hour meticulously planning, thinking out. I don't get these people who organize stuff like that. But apparently this is what he did. And he goes through and, and he gets it. And then he reads this quote. And he steps back. And he looks at the list. And he realizes... And he thinks to himself, he, these are his exact words, if I got hit by a bus next week, am I really going to be that disappointed that I didn't see Paris from the top of the Eiffel Tower? Probably not. Probably not. And yet there it was on the list. The list that was contingent for his happiness. This list creating a not-so-subtle message in his life that it will be lacking if he doesn't achieve these things. The blessings he desires but does not have. So, as Tareen says, he's, in a sense, creating his own hell and his own devastation. Chasing the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which doesn't really exist. So that night, he admits to crumpling up the list and throwing it away. He threw all of the work away, and he decided to change his attitude and take Doreen's advice. He made a blessings list, recounting not just those special trips like the ones to Grand Canyon, and and he didn't necessarily cancel the flight plans to Paris, but he also factored in those little gifts. First time he held his son. First time his wife told him he loved him. And he reflected on the good things and has been so blessed by that. It's the childlike perspective that I think we should all have. The young child, not the spoiled teenager side. Sorry, teenagers. But here's another example. My dad, he's a retired natural gas man. Well, I mean, he still has natural gas, but that's beside the point. (laughs) His little office downtown, he... uh, uh, sold appliances. Well, he didn't sell appliances, that, but their, off, their office sold appliances. The big ones, you know, water heaters and, and, and dishwashers and refrigerators, all of that kind of thing. So every now and then, it wasn't too often, but I would remember he'd bring home the big box. 
All right? Now, little boxes from Amazon, whatever, okay, but the big box, all right? And my sister and I, we'd have a blast playing in the cardboard box. And I want us to think today, how unlikely is it that if your biggest blessing, your most wonderful adventure today would happen inside an old beat-up cardboard box? But it was for us as a kid, so what changed? I guess what I'm trying to say is the most unlikely adventure isn't in the gift. It isn't in the experience or the things or even in meeting a particular person. But it is in Jesus and his blessing. So as we look to the Magi, how did they respond to the gift of Jesus? How do we respond to the gift of Jesus? I think it's really simple. We worship with wonder. Worship with wonder. So first, they went to worship. I want to isolate each part of this. Worship. Go to worship. Hey, congratulations. You guys have already done the first part of this message. Give yourselves a pat on the back. Good job. You go. You show up. Matthew 2, 2 says, We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. This leads me to ask, what stars in your life inspire you to worship? For me, sometimes it's a beautiful sunrise or the soft orange glow of the moon on the horizon on a cold winter's night. Sometimes it's a song. Sometimes it's the church saying together the Lord's Prayer. It inspires worship. But what happens to us most of the time is we'll see a star We'll see a moment of worship, take a picture of it, post it to our Instagram, and move on. You know? Do we actually respond with worship? Do we actually go in response to worship? They didn't just stay at home because it's easier to stay in your pajamas than get the kids ready and bring them to worship. They went. One of the things I've been learning this last year is a concept that comes from Atomic Habits by James Clear. Every action, every choice is a vote for the person you're becoming. And we here, we want to be Christ followers. We believe ourselves to be Christ followers. But do our habits and reactions to these stars in our lives, do they vote for us to continue growing as Christ followers? I mean, coming to worship, good, that's one. I mean, finding time to honor Jesus, Daily? I mean, if every time or every other time we hit the snooze button on a Sunday morning or skip devotional time throughout our day, we're actually voting against being the Christ follower we desire to be. Every time we pass an opportunity to help feed the hungry or join the conversation in a small group, we're passing and voting against proven ways of coming closer to Jesus. Are these the only ways? No, they're not the only ways. But I think too often we're looking for the miraculous, big, spectacular show of, of the crucifixion with the orchestra and the strings and the real moving thing when we come to worship, which is great and wonderful, but then aren't we just cultivating the same kind of experience? Rather than just responding with simple, pure worship? Bigger and better looks like the adventure. That's what the world says. Bigger, better, harder, faster looks like the adventure. But I think the blessing that God wants to share in our lives, the unlikely adventure happens in the mundane, in the repetitive, and in the proven track records. So when you are inspired to worship, when you see the star, worship. But don't stop there. This is, this, is a, this is an advanced technique. We need to worship with something. We need to worship with wonder. I don't think it's enough to just show up. Second, they worshiped with wonder. These men are supposedly Jewish, or supposedly not Jewish, I should say. Um, except they're able to cite scripture. How many of you can cite the scripture from Micah that they were citing when they talked to Herod? No? The book of Micah? Come on. I tease. It's not a common one. It's all right. 
What, what happened, though, we can hear their heart. It's not just an arrival. It's not just a response where they just showed up. Showing up is half the battle, okay? We've talked about that. But listen to what's in their heart. Matthew 2.10. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. That sounds like wonder to me. What does that mean for us? I think it means we study God's word, not to say, hey, I made it through the gospel of John in the month of January. That's not what it's about. It's about leaning in, trying to discover what is in God's heart. I want to give you a little bit of a challenge here. One of the exercises I'll share with you. To, to check your heart. If you're not sure if you have wonder in your worship, do this, okay? Look back on the last week or month. I'll give you a month, okay? Look back on the last month and think about the biblical messages or your Bible readings. When has any of those messages that you've received or read changed you? I'm not talking years ago. I'm not talking about your initial conversion. I'm talking about where have you seen God recently? Where have you heard his message that's affected your heart and changed the way you're seeing the world? It may just be a little change. But if you can't answer that question, then you may be losing the wonder. So often, we believe God's word needs to change the world. And if it's capable of changing the world, it ought to be capable of changing us. It really should. If the Bible doesn't change your political be beliefs, doesn't affect the way you view the world, or just even get you to think, then you're losing the wonder. And what happens when we lose the wonder? Then eventually we'll lose the meaning of worship. They're not always, these blessings, these Wonders, these stars that we look for, aren't always in the places that we expect. I mean, there's wonder when you look at the Christmas tree, right? But how many of you have already put the Christmas tree away? I haven't. Maybe tomorrow. But how many, how many of you still have presents under the tree? Most of us don't. So what happened to those little joys, those little happinesses? Well, they're gone. But does the symbol of the tree change? We should be filled with wonder, just like these magi. As I close the message today, I want to invite you to worship with wonder. It goes far beyond a baby in a manger, and it goes far beyond a man on a cross and an empty tomb. In fact, one last biblical example, 30 years after this whole scene happens, a couple of guys are visiting, and Philip says to his friend Nathan, Nathaniel, dude, you need to come see this guy, Jesus of Nazareth. Let's go check it out. Let's check it out. Do you know how Nathaniel responds? It's like me saying, well, who's ever heard of North Platte, Nebraska? You know how many people I had to explain where North Platte was when we were moving from Kansas? Like, I mean, we should know where this town is. It's a lot larger than, than many others, but who's, who's ever heard of that? This is what Nathaniel says to Philip, John 1, 46. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Like, I've never even heard of it. And what does Philip say? Just come and see. Just try it. My friends, as we consider the unlikely adventure of the Magi, I invite you to look back on the adventure of the past year and count your blessings. Quit worrying about the bucket list, the what ifs, the if onlys. And as you count those blessings, as you see those stars, try this. Just, just try it. Come and see what happens. What happens. 
Respond with worship. And I believe you'll have the most unlikely adventure. Amen? Will you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, I thank you for this day and this time. An opportunity to reflect on your word and to glorify your name. If anything today, Jesus, our presence in worship here is to honor and to glorify you and your kingdom. So fill our hearts with wonder, fill our hearts with worship, and give us the strength and encouragement we need to move forward, counting every blessing along the way. We ask this in your holy and precious name. And all who gathered said, amen. We're going to end with a joyful song, Go Tell It on the Mountain, number 251 in your hymnals. I invite you to stand as you are able. Let's sing. Go tell it on the mountain Over in the hills and everywhere I go Tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Our shepherds are watching Our silent flocks by night Behold our high heavens Their shows thank you so much again for joining us in worship. I'm so glad you're here. You don't know. I, every time I get to share the message, it's like, I hope somebody shows up. Because it's always the off weekends, right? I'm, sorry, I'm getting off track. Uh, quick reminder, we are feeding the hungry this Friday. The offering plates are at the door. Uh, small group opportunities are coming. These are great ways to respond to the message today. But most of all, I'm just glad you're here. You know, we're the children of God. We might need to get out some cardboard today. We might just need to step back and take in the wonder. Count your blessings, my friend. You all are blessings to me and to this community. So please keep it up. Be the shining star that I know God has created you to be. And I know you'll find the most unlikely, unlikeliest, is that how you say that? <laughs> of adventures. So thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next time. See you next year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.